Uh, welcome, everybody. Welcome, welcome to the world transformed, and welcome, welcome to culture in the culture war. Um, we um, both, both new socialist and TWT have often made the point that culture is at least partly where socialism happens, and that the culture war isn't isn't a distraction from sort of bread and butter economism, but a key theatre in that resistance against the forces of reaction. And um, we're here to discuss what forms this resistance should take. Um, so what are we going to be discussing? Well, th there's a claim from some socialists and from some liberals that the culture war is, is a mirage, a sort of diversionary tactic on the part of the right intended to divert our attention away from real issues, quote unquote, real issues of economic inequality. But this, this is quite a liberal framing, a quite a liberal understanding of what is in reality a struggle against the apparatuses and logics of the state and of, of capitalist society. And there are bits of the left that have kind of gone along with this, in some cases quite enthusiastically. Um, now, <clears throat> Others have, you know, others have seized upon it with a sort of like opportunistic glee, precisely because it, it sort of brings with it this implication that the, the effects of political economy are not racialised or gendered or indeed structured by characteristics beyond class, right? Um, so that's a, that suits a certain economistic socialism, which, um, if we're being sort of charitable, might think of itself as being pragmatic, um, whereas. A new socialist, our contention is that this class first or class reductionist approach is, is politically wrong but also strategically wrong. All right, um, <clears throat> so we've got, um, we've got a, an amazing panel, frankly, um, but it's important to say that the session was originally slated to feature new socialist um, stalwart readers, editor Jude Wanger, but unfortunately Jude is, is on a, a currently an extended period of compassionate leave and is unable to attend. Now, so no, nobody's going to be a like-for-like like like replacement for Jude, but we are absolutely delighted to say that we've got, we've got Zara from No More Exclusions joining us um, at very short notice as well. Um, so... So I'm, I'm, I'm going to introduce people one by one and then we'll go, we'll go to Zara first. So Zara is, is co-founder of No More Exclusions, which is a, a black-led, abolitionist, grassroots movement of educators which seeks to bring about a more inclusive education system and, and address the heavily racialised disparity in, in school exclusions. Um, Zara is a teacher with two decades of experience in both mainstream and alternative provision, a trade unionist and, and a, a community campaigner and she also recently completed a master's in social justice and education. Social justice and education. So can we have another clap for Zara? Uh, Dawn Butler needs no introduction. We are, we are incredibly excited to, to welcome Dawn to the session, and not simply because she possesses so many qualities that are vanishingly rare amongst parliamentary politicians. Charisma, integrity, ability to give a decent speech. We could go on and on. I mean, I say that, but my voice is gone. So, we're, <laughs> so we're, she, she's kind of fighting through the pain barrier a bit to, to, to be here, which we appreciate even more. Um, Dawn's political co commitments are maybe not an unambiguously aligned with those of New Socialists, but we admire and respect her immensely due to her openness, her loyalty to Jeremy Corbyn's project, And just as importantly, her willingness to show solidarity with the most marginalised, even when it's hard, and her preparedness not only to adjust her thinking on various issues, but to do so quite publicly. So thank you very much to Dawn for coming. Owen Hatherley, uh, my Southampton compatriot, um, has long been a friend to New Socialist and has consistently championed and supported our work, even, even when it's kind of like annoyed people. Um, he is, of course, a very fine author and journalist. He is also an important and intriguing cultural figure. Um, <laughs> 
In um, an even halfway civilised society, Owen would have his own sort of show on BBC Two at precisely 11.35 on a Sunday night, sort of <laughs> doing like a cultural roundup thing, but we, we don't live in a, in a halfway civilised society. Um, but this, this status is a sort of a cultural figure, um, e even though, you know, and, and one that is that's respected by even, even Sadiq Khan, albeit reluctantly. He, he is, is, is more remarkable, perhaps, because um, not only is Owen unashamedly on the left, um, he's also working class. And both of these characteristics are becoming increasingly rare within British arts and culture and criticism. Uh, his book, Red Metropolis, Socialism and the Government of London was published last year by Repeated Books, but I think you've done another one since then, haven't you? It's a bit of an old... Like it's, you know... And some previously warmed... <laughs> you've really given it a hard sell there, mate, haven't <laughs> you? Um, Probably like corned beef hash. <laughs> <laughs> so welcome, Owen. <laughs> Uh, Juliet Jakes is another much-loved friend and comrade. Uh, she's known widely for her work on trans issues, including her incredibly patient, to say the least, and courageous attempts to reason with the most appalling transphobes of the so supposedly liberal British media, and was part of Culture for Labour, a group of artists and musicians and writers organising around the 2019 election. As well as a journalist, she's also a writer of fiction, a filmmaker, a critic, uh, an educator and the creator and host of the excellent and culturally enriching Sweet 212 podcast. Her collection of short stories, Variations, was published this year by Influx Press. Um, welcome, Juliet. <laughs> and I'm one of the many new socialist Toms. <laughs> uh, so we're going to go to Zara first. You don't want to hold it? Do you just want this one? Can we move that one? Can we just? Yeah, all right, great. Thank you, because my hand will just shake the whole time. <laughs> Hi, everyone. It's amazing to be here, and um, I'm so honoured to be on this panel. When Tom, was it this Tom that messaged me? to say, <laughs> just don't know these days which Tom will come through. When he said, look, can you just step up, step in, and speak up about culture wars, I thought, mm, I'm a teacher, I'm day to day, a parent working on, uh, you know, against school exclusions and carcerality in education. What, what, I never really talk about culture wars. And so I, I went to my son, who's 20, and I was like, what do you think about this? He said to me, I don't know what you're talking about. So then I went to the other barometer, which is my mum, and she's like, don't really know what this is. This to me are my common people in my life, right? And, um, and then I started to talk about it with some of my comrades in No More Exclusions, and we were like, oh, this is what it might mean, right? This is how this is interpreted, <laughs> right? So the way in which I'm going to talk about this is in relation to a, one of the proxies that I believe it has acquired and is the proxy to identity politics, briefly, and then I'll relate it to three current live actions that everyone in this room and beyond can get involved in that relates to quote unquote culture wars and education. So I will start with one of my muses and that's Audrey Lord, who talks about uh, misnaming distortions um, in the following way. Institutionalized rejection uh, of difference is an absolute necessity in a profit economy which needs outsiders as surplus people. As members of such an economy, we have all been programmed to respond to the human differences between us with fear and loathing and to handle that difference in one of three ways. Ignore it, and if that is not possible, copy it, and if we think it is dominant, destroy it. If we, um, if we, if, if it is subordinate. But we have no patterns of relating across human differences as equals. As a result, those differences have been misnamed and misused in the service of separation and confusion. Um, certainly there are very few differences between us 
there are very there are very real differences between us, race, age, and sex, but it is not the differences between us that are separating us. It is rather our refusal to recognize and to, um, to recognize those differences and to examine the distortions which result from the misnaming. And so that's really my long preamble with the help of Audre Lorde. In, and I just want you to think about the words misnaming and distortions, if that's okay, like throughout as I'm talking, have those two words in the back of your mind all the time. I want to talk about three actions in education that I personally and our collectives, the collectives that we're in, have been involved in that have directly impacted upon um, the subject that we're talking about. And, but before I dive into that, we do need to make sure we don't misname my proxy. What was the proxy that I was going to use for culture wars? Identity politics. I need to go to source for that, and source is the Combahee River Collective Statement, April 1977. Um, a term that was coined out of generations of struggle, resistance, and militancy of black feminists. The definition of identity politics from the 70s, from that group, very important black feminist to me, the most general statement of our politics at the present time would be that we are actively committed to struggling against racial, sexual, heterosexual, and class oppression, oppression and see our particular task, the development of integrated analysis and practice based upon the fact that the major system of oppression, the major systems of oppressions are interlocking. The synthesis of these oppressions creates the conditions of our lives. Um, and they are manifold, simultaneous oppressions um, that all women of color face. So that's kind of the basic promise, premise up, upon which we organize day to day in all our collectives, in No More Exclusions, in uh, Coalition of Anti-Racist Educators, in CAPE and others. Um, and now I want to talk about the three actions that we've been involved, right, that, that I believe have been a challenge to quote unquote culture wars, which my family doesn't recognize in those terms, but we recognize there's something going on. Uh, the first one, exactly, almost exactly a year ago, on the 24th of September 2020, some of you uh, will remember that the government published some new RSC, relation, Relationship and Sex, curriculum guidance, um, and it caused quite an uproar among some of us, uh, because in that guidance, um, the government was, ask, was basically introducing censorship and limiting our freedom to teach students in the ways that we feel are correct, right? That are right. And um, I mean, it was shocking, actually. It was, the wording was shocking. And some of the stuff that was not it, uh, we were able to legally challenge. Um, and we were able to kind of get them to do what they do really well, which is a U-turn. Um, about two months later, just before Christmas, just as the time, you know, the pre-action letter was about to expire and they had the time to respond, they said, we will review the guidance. So under that curriculum guidance, what were they saying? Um, well, one of the things they were saying, they were saying to, um, the guidance was for head teachers, principal, senior leadership teams, teachers, curriculum coordinators, and governing bodies and proprietors, because let's not forget the privatization and marketization of education. Uh, in the section name, using external agencies and choosing resources, which is something that as a teacher I'd like to think I have some discretion over, that I am qualified to do, right? That's why I received all my training I've been teaching for 20 years for. Apparently not. The guidance casually, boldly, painstakingly provides what amounted to a censorship list and clear warning to educators in England, um, really about who is in charge, what you can't do, don't step out of line, and a reminder of what each of those very important British values are all about. In the guidance, the government stern warning preamble said, schools should not under any circumstance use resources produced by organizations that take extreme, another key word, extreme political stances on matters. This is the case even if the material itself is not extreme, as the use of it could imply endorsement. On the mix and match censorship list, because part of the misnaming requires distortion, publicly stated, part of the guys and said, publicly stated desire to abolish or overthrow democracy, capitalism, and end free and fair elections. So like, what did you call it when you used to go to Woolworths? Mix and match sweets? Pick and mix. Throw them all together, pick and mix, thank you. Pr throw it all together and just stick an extremist label on it, right? They won't know, the British public are stupid, and the educators even more so. 
The use or endorsement of races, including anti-Semitic language or, or communications, promoting divisive, one of my favorite victim narratives, that are harmful to British society, and the, they, they save the best for last, in my opinion, selecting and presenting information to make unsubstantiated accusations against state institutions. I mean, that's literally what I do on a daily basis. <laughs> so, what did we do? We took them to court, we threatened, they, they did the U-turn, and I just want to make everybody aware that I just checked in with the lawyers, because months pass, the, world, the legal world is very strange, nothing, we didn't hear anything, I checked on the website, the bloody guidance is still there. So even though they promised to review it, it's still very much live. And so those who are unaware that there is a live legal challenge going on might not, might apply it, might be intimidated by it, right? So that's one thing that we really, I just want to say to everyone in this room, we still got to fight this kind of assault on our freedom to teach and, you know, to, I suppose, I suppose um, be the educators that our students deserve to have. The next thing that is also very live uh, was Pimlico Academy. How many of you heard of Pimlico Academy? Let me see your hands. Oh, that's not enough hands. <laughs> Pimlico Academy in central London, amazing. Parent, unions, educators, strike action, protesting outside against the academy structure, the head teacher, the uniform policy, they had a very big British flag flying outside. Um, students felt that the uh, curriculum, they were, they were protesting against four things, poverty, discrimination, the curriculum, and there's a fourth thing, they called it academics. Uh, under all of these headings, um, sorry, they, they did a petition, thousand signatures, so they followed what they call student voice, you know, the democratic process within the school, they were completely ignored and eventually decided to, to do a peaceful protest. They still stayed on site, they actually didn't leave the school site, stayed on, it was um, on the 30th of March. Eventually the school caved in, agreed to the demands that they would look at the school policy, they would look at the uniform, which was discriminatory, the, the curriculum, they would look at the, the, the demands that, you know, these very expensive school uniforms that um, people can't afford and so on. Eventually the head teacher resigned and of course is still within the trust, but um, how, do people, how do people say in this country, they, he, failed, he failed up. So he's now in charge of uh, inspections in Ofsted, right? <laughs> so this is the state of, the, of affairs in English education system, right? When you mess it up, don't worry, you'll do really, really well um, if you represent the hegemonic <laughs> group, the dominant group. So that's, that's another um, campaign that's very much alive. And the third and final one, and I, and I think I'm over my time now, sorry Tom. Okay. The third one is really important, and I've spoken to this uh, teacher this morning, he called me. His name is Josh Aduse. He was a, a PE teacher at the Harris Academy in Tottenham. He put out a petition, very brave young teacher. They say there's a, there's a teaching crisis, I wonder why. Very brave. On, uh, I think it was third week in April, it was a Tuesday, he put out a petition on Twitter in which he uh, basically was protesting against um, the fact that the new head teacher had been in, 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 uh, on the job for less than a month and on arrival excluded three black boys just because he could. Um, at the same time as introducing zero tolerance policies which we know discriminate against children who have special education needs and disabilities and are from uh, disadvantaged groups, etc. And also announced just again, because it's the kind of thing you do during a pandemic, a restructuring and redundancy program, uh, at the same time bullying staff to accept the new terms or resign, which again, many of us are familiar with, myself included. Um, he published the petition online looking for support on the Tuesday. On the Thursday, um, he was uh, suspended and his case is live. He's asking for support, that's another Right? That's another cause that we really need to get behind. And, and then subsequently was contacted by the BBC, um, spoke about it. What are you supposed to do? Are you supposed to be quiet? Didn't they say that silence is violence? 
Isn't that what we keep saying? As, as an educator, are you supposed to speak up when you see injustices that are done uh, within your institution? Or are you supposed to keep quiet and become complicit and collude? Because essentially, that's what we are asked to do. So he was dismissed. So there's an unfair dismissal case. And the reason why I'm talking about Josh, one is because he's asking for support, but also because his case represents many cases. And it represents the kind of backlash that we receive whenever we speak up. And we really need to get behind these cases, particularly when they relate to the marketization and privatization of education and the obscene um, policies and practices that are in places in this institution. So thank you very much for listening. Yeah, when I was a primary school teacher, one of the examples used in our anti-extremism training was a, a guy who'd been radicalised and blamed the banks for the global financial crisis. <laughs> we're going to go to Dawn next, um, because she's got to go, and like, we're, we're with you. This won't work. Oh. Um, thank you, Tom. And Tom says that I give great speeches, but I've lost my voice. So I'm not quite sure I can live up to that expectation. But um, I'll try and maybe talk a little bit lower and seduce you with my words. <laughs> um, so culture and cultural. I'm going to start with something that I think is a little bit controversial. I don't actually think this government gives a shit about culture wars. I think it's all about power. I think they'll do whatever they have to do to hold on to power. If that means that they stoke a culture war or they demonize a particular group of person, then they'll do it if it means they can hold on to power. You know, the reason why there was a two-year delay in the Gender Recognition Act is because they wanted to fill that void with hate. They were doing focus groups, you know, and it was playing to their core base. So that's why they continued to do that. I mean, Priti Patel uh, refused to condemn fans who booed uh, football players taking the knee. Boris Johnson refused to boo football players taking the knee, even though they knew it was fueling racism and racism in football. That they refused to condemn it because they knew it was going to help them to hold on to power and appeal to a certain base, which they were appealing to. They refused to condemn. Uh, their own Tory MPs, like Lee Anderson, who claimed to boycott the Euros due to the players taking the knee. I mean, have you ever heard anything so ridiculous? I mean, Brendan Clark Smith, he compared taking the knee to England and German players making the Nazi salute in the 1930s. Or Natalie Elphick, who said Marcus Rashford should have spent more time perfecting his game rather than playing politics. If it wasn't for Marcus Rashford, the kids would have gone hungry last summer. You know, he can, he can do politics well and play football well. That's actually a lesson to us all, right? So I think this government is all about, I mean, this is a, the most corrupt government that we're ever likely to see in our lifetime. They are corrupt to the core. They have stolen our money and given it to their mates. Because they, they're in power, they say, we've written off 143 million pounds, so now we can't even ask questions about it because they've written it off. So we're not allowed to ask questions about it. Billions of pounds have gone astray. So I think it's a calculated culture war by this government. And the thing is with football is that they're all fine stoking this, let the fans boo, you know, we're, we culture, you know, taking the knee is Marxism. I had people saying, you're a Marxist. Like, do you know what fucking Marxist is? Do you mean, what are you, what are you heckling me about? You don't even know. You know, they were encouraging this, but when the team started doing well, all of a sudden they started to change because they want power, right? They're going in the direction of travel that's going to um, make them more powerful. But when we lost, now that was something because the hate and the vile that started to come out in regards to this culture war that the Tories themselves were stoking, they started, the, it was in plain sight, uh, the extent of that damage with all the death threats. And all of a sudden, I think they decided that because they focus grouped it. Don't think they did it because they had a change of heart. They didn't have a change of heart. Some of them have very little tiny hearts. <laughs> And, uh, and some of their hearts are damaged badly. And um, 
So they didn't have a change of heart at all. And footballer Rhys James said, we learn more about society when we lose, far more than we learn from society when we win. Because if we had won, all of a sudden, everybody would have been applauded, it would have been amazing, diversity is great, um, but that racism would have still been there. But because we lost, all that racism was brought to the fore and everybody saw it. And, and so the solution to uh, combating the culture war is doing the work that we do, not listening to the legacy media who only report things um, that suits them. Uh, the new media that's around, Byline TV, Byline Times, Navara Media, Double Down News, all of the countless blogs and podcasts. You know, we start to build a narrative around the truth that's out there. And I think there are more good people than bad people in society. In fact, I qualified that. I know there's more good people than bad people in society. We all have to redouble our efforts in being anti-racist because that is how we combat the culture, the culture war. We have to ensure that we are each other's allies. That is how we combat the culture war. We don't leave anyone alone. We don't leave anyone fighting the battle alone because they are different, because they are from the LGBTQ plus community, because they are Muslim, because they are Jewish, because they are Hindu, because they are black. We don't leave anybody standing alone. We stand together, we fight together, and we beat them together. Thank you. I told you she was good. <laughs> well done. Um, so I, I'm going to go off a bit of a tangent now, so um, forgive me. Um, and so when, when, when people kind of talk about uh, sort of culture and class, or sort of culture versus class, or talk about the problems of a class first strategy, obviously I'm the culture editor of Tribune, and we have an explicit policy of using the word worker at least once in every article. Um, so um, I feel that we're probably, you know, the, the, the being slightly in, in interpolated in, in that. Um, but um, what I want to talk about just for the kind of 10 minutes I've got allotted is sort of alternative cultures and subcultures, because I think this is one of the things that is kind of at the heart of this disagreement is where subcultures and uh, uh, kind of feature where where you know whether or not they're a thing that is 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 politically divisive or alienating you know the the, the idea of the le that often comes up if you spend far too much time on social media of like should the left be more normal um and um you know i think that's <laughs> I mean, often, you know, the people saying this, by the very fact that they're talking about this at all, are marking themselves off as ex being extremely far from being normal. Um, but nonetheless, I think there's, a, there's, there's an... I don't want to dismiss this stuff entirely, because I think there's a sort of kernel of something in there which is important. Um, and I think there's a kind of... Something in the way that these debates are sort of framed, which I, I sort of... Sometimes kind of rankles with me a little bit. And um, so I want to start off being in Brighton with an experience that I think Tom um, might also have had if you grow up in, um, you know, one of the ports along the south coast, like Southampton, where we are from, or Portsmouth or Plymouth, that you then go to somewhere like Brighton. And there's this very kind of, it creates this sort of, um, this kind of love-hate thing, which is very, um, very complicated, which I think, this may, not, lo, may no longer be true, but I think it's broadly, you can say, if in the 1990s, if you were growing up in Southampton and you had long hair, you were a pufta, and you were going to get your head kicked in on your way home from school, at least once. Um, you know, these, there, was, there were certain things that, like, the you know, difference was extremely heavily policed in the 1990s in, 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 in cities and towns like that. Um, the levels of homophobia and racism were off the scale. Um, and then you would go to somewhere like Brighton 
And the first feeling was one of immense freedom. That you are here and you can, you know, be more or less who you are without fear that you are going to get your head kicked in for it. And I don't exaggerate here, by the way. Um, and that, in itself, uh, the, the first thing about that, of course, that you, you have is that feeling of like, oh, thank God. Um, you know, no longer do you have to kind of constantly kind of watch your back or keep an eye on people if you're walking around the shops. You know, you don't, you don't have that. That kind of sense of sort of fear was immediately kind of lifted. But um, you would then kind of find if you were kind of, uh, you know, hanging out in the radical left scene or the indie scene, both of which I sort of um, dabbled in through friends who were um, in Brighton when I, was, when, when I was in my late teens and 20s, um, is you would quite quickly learn certain things about them. One of which was that you would realise fairly quickly that it was an overwhelmingly middle class scene in both cases. And it was a scene which was quite kind of uh, tightly policed. It was very, very, it, uh, there was both scenes that were immensely cliquey. There were ways in which they could tell who was in and who was out, who was welcome and who wasn't. And if you, if you weren't able to kind of um, tick those boxes and kind of, you know, uh, weren't able to kind of respond to those codes in the correct way, you would frequently, it was a, a, an experience that would often be deeply alienating. And also you had to listen to a lot of Manu Chao, um, which was really, particularly in the radical left scene, I mean in the indie scene you had to listen to a lot of pavement, which was just as bad as my view. Um, but in any case they were, you know, aside from musical taste, they were, they, you know, if you were coming from a working class background, they were alienating environments. And maybe in some ways that was a good thing. Maybe that challenge in certain ways was a good thing of like, you know, here you have to do things differently. Here, rather than making me a cup of coffee, you have to make the special drink um, from this kind of slightly kind of bovril smelling jar. Um, I still can't remember what that drink actually was, but it was really big on like the radical left scene circa 2001. Um, but um, that, you know, there was a, a lot of really irritating stuff going on. <laughs> Um, which was, you know, which, which was in some ways kind of superfluous, you know, it wasn't very necessary, you know, there was a kind of element of like, well, we do the special kind of consumerism that's better than your consumerism. That was really big. Um, and so on that, that sense, you know, one, one kind of immediately gets a feeling of subcultures, of, you know, the kind of, the kind of limitations of them. Um, they were things where, you know, they, they could be, you, you, they could give you a, sen a sense of freedom and a sense of finally being allowed to be yourself, but also, you know, one of like, if you are not with us and our strange drink, you are against us. Um, so, um, and I think this then leads people on the left, or I guess on the more workerist left, onto, on, onto, a, onto a second point, which I think is a fallacy, which is that subcultures in and of themselves are a bad thing. And that the worst thing you can say about the left is that it would become a subculture. Now, I think if the left is a subculture, that's a problem, because the left aims to be the dominant force in society. It aims to be the hegemonic force. Um, and the word sub implies sub. Um, however, that's, that, that, that sort of, that doesn't mean, I don't think, that within that there can't be a kind of relationship between those things that's quite productive. Um, so, and the obvious point on this, which is lost on a lot of people who are, I guess, you know, sort of tendance Angela Nagel, I guess, you know, the kind of like, let's all be normal tendency. Um, one of the kind of um, problems of this, of course, and this is an argument from hindsight, but bollocks, you know, it's, it's, it's a good argument, um, is that what was once considered completely weird and completely unacceptable and completely a vote loser if you were in the Labour right, um, later becomes an idea which is much more accepted at all levels of society. And the really obvious example here is the so-called loony left in the 1980s and Labour councils. So for those that kind of, um, you know, don't know the history so well, you had a kind of, um, you know, a sort of municipal left in um, a lot of cities like sort of Sheffield, Liverpool, particularly London and the Greater London Council and the Inner London Education Authority, um, where a lot of kind of social movement ideas and new left ideas and liberation ideas kind of flowed into the Labour left. And, and, I, and a moment that quite similar, really, to the kind of Corbyn mo moment in lots of in lots of ways. And the press attacks on that movement all focused on cultural issues, never on economic ones. Um, you know, the, they were loon the loony left were loony for supporting LGBT rights. The loony left were loony for supporting Nelson Mandela and the ANC. 
They were loony for suggesting that Sinn Féin should be included in peace talks in Northern Ireland. They were loony for supporting anti-racist and anti-imperialist initiatives. They were loony for suggesting that the Brixton riots were actually a popular uprising rather than just people nicking stuff. Um, still a popular view on riots, I find. Um, and, um, you know, these ideas are all pretty now deeply, deeply discredited. The idea that, you know, that, that, I mean, I use those examples in particular because of the fact that they're, you know, that, that they're now fairly kind of widely accepted, you know, on the ANC, on Northern Ireland, on anti-racism, although obviously it's not an argument that's been won, but it's an argument which has moved on a great deal from the mid-80s. Similarly on LGBT rights, you know, that one of the things that one of Thatcher's biographers recently claimed is that the reason why Clause 28, which basically bans the um, so-called promotion of homosexuality in schools, so that, oh, well, she didn't bring that in because she was homophobic. Some of her best friends were gay. Actually, the reason why she brought it in was in order to curb the power of councils. And it was like, this is all connected, you fucking fools. That's the same thing. <laughs> That's the same thing. Um, and that, you know, that, 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 that what, what's, but what's so interesting about that 80s moment, and, you know, you can look at, like, the debates between people like Neil Kinnock and, and Roy Hattersley, um, these kind of new Labour, these sort of old Labour dinosaurs of the time, and there was a report by later new Labour minister, uh, Patricia Hewitt, on the so-called loony left councils that was just like, they're losing us loads of votes, you know, the Daily Mail and the Sun and so forth, you know, always having stories about the loony left. It's losing us loads and loads of votes. And yet a huge amount of the stuff that was being considered loony left was actually among the things that were instituted by the otherwise very right-wing government, the otherwise very right-wing Labour governments that were elected in 1997, 2001 and 2005. Actually, the cultural argument was substantially won, whereas the economic argument, we didn't really even start discussing it again in a, in a big way until 2008 and the years after then. Um, so I think there's a, there's a point there, with the, you know, the, the why can't we be normal people in the mid-80s, such as Neil Kinnock and so forth. Um, we're actually missing the fact that these people were, you know, having experiments in, in freedom and liberation that would actually percolate down into society far more than their incredibly tedious political project would. Um, a third point on this, I think, I suppose there's, I, I'd like to kind of point to examples, and they're kind of quite, they're quite kind of well-known examples, um, but examples where I think these, these things have been cut across. Uh, where, where, you know, this kind of divide of sort of class here, everything else there, has been cut across and you've instead had much more sort of productive solidarities have, have emerged rather than seeing these as either or. Um, one of them um, would obviously be in, in, in particular trade union struggles from that period. Um, you know, partly because of the film Pride, everyone now knows, well, everyone, most people in this room, I imagine, now know about lesbians and gay support the minors, where... Um, you know, people that were involved both in the Communist Party and the Gay Liberation Movement in the 80s were involved in solidarity actions with the miners during the miners' strike, and that that provided, you know, a great deal of solidarity across places that were considered, whether this is correct or not, and I, I think it's another matter, considered to be deeply opposed. So it was considered that miners were inherently bigoted and that their communities were inherently conservative, and that, that you know, that therefore they wouldn't possibly be involved in the gay liberation movement. But actually, a solidarity was, was, was built there, which ended up being quite enduring. And actually, rather than something that kind of comes from without to the miners, um, one can actually look at the way that, you know, the kind of, um, a lot of the people that were involved in leading roles in the miners' strike, obviously Arthur Scargill, were also involved in solidarity, solidarity, in solidarity actions with the Grimwick strikers, with the, um, South Asian women who were involved in the, in the, in, in the crucial Grunwick strike in the late 70s in the photo processing plant in West London, where they were basically shunned by the official trade union movement, but the NUM, the National Union of Mine Workers, sent flying pickets to support them. So that they're, you know, these, these, these are things which, which, which are cut across, as it were. And another one, so as well as there being kind of moments where solidarity, I think, makes this kind of alleged cultural opposition more... Um, you know, sort of dissolve in certain respects. One of the other ones, I think, is, is the ways in which they can energise each other. And there, I think, the, the, the example is really the sort of sequence which Paul Gilroy identifies and actually sees as a decline in some ways, but, sort of, but identifies in There Ain't No Black in the Union Jack of the Rock Against Racism movement 
um, and the Anti-Nazi League and later the Greater London Council in London and, and also with kind of branches elsewhere in, in other cities um, where specifically subcultural movements were fastened upon as the means to politicize. Um, specifically roots reggae and punk rock were specifically as the movements that, that were seen as ways of building unity and solidarity. Rather than just like, oh, this is, a, this is a, you know, this is a subculture, it's got nothing to do with us, put your cardigan on and listen to Mark, Max Bygraves. So it was like, right, let's, you know, let's get in there and let's, you know, and, 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 and you know, let's use these already politicised movements, because both movements were already politicised, and then let's take them and, 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 you know, and help them grow in many ways, and that's what those things did. And in the kind of festival programme that the Greater London Council had, which very much built on that, on those kind of punk and roots reggae and two-tone scenes, um, they created an, a, a celebratory space where new forms of freedom and new forms of solidarity and new forms of liberation could actually be lived out. And that, I think, is an enormously positive thing. And if there had been a decision of, we'll have no part in subcultures, that, that could never have happened. Um, if we had kind of constantly decided this isn't normal, we're going to be normal that couldn't have taken place. And I think that's probably one of the few things of the left in the last 40 years that's actually interesting and exciting and could have, you know, um, a thing we should be proud of. So that's all I've got to say. Thanks, Owen. Yeah, it's really interesting to hear what you say about, you know, all these ideas of the loony left that were derided during the 1980s and after that eventually became common sense and became government policy. And I think it's, it's been really interesting in the last year to see that after 40 years of being told that the loony left is desperate to ban Christmas, the rabid right come to power and in their first year... <laughs> that, comrades, is hegemony. Um, so I want to pick up a bit, uh, just to start by just saying, you know, what I think the culture war is. And it's, you know, as Dawn suggested, it's, it's something that's sort of not necessarily coming from conservative government policy. It's something they've picked up on because it's just worked for them. I think, you know, on the left it's often quite tempting to look at the right and think that they're, you know, these like Machiavellian geniuses who have everything planned out and actually they're just sort of stumbling along trying whatever works and it's just the reason they keep winning is because it's not a level playing field. Um, but, you know, the sort of culture war tactics is obviously something that's moved from the right-wing press, and obviously, you know, we are living in a time in which both the right and the centre are very much governing in alliance and through and with uh, various parts of particularly the, um, well, the print and broadcast media. But, you know, the idea is to sort of continue these, um, uh, these kind of forever wars, really, uh, about a certain topic, uh, usually by reducing um, a lot of identity politics issues, as, as Zara said, to these sort of rather crude and ultimately um, unresolvable um, talking points that then prevent uh, those of us on the left who actually want to kind of propose and build a better world uh, from doing so. And I mean, I'm talking from a, a trans perspective, and um, Tom mentioned in his uh, introduction to me my, uh, my patient attempts to uh, reason with the liberals. Um, which went badly um, and have ceased. Um, um, but but you know, in, in, in the cases sort of trans trans issues, I you know, I and many of my sort of friends on the left were sort of saying, well actually look, trans healthcare is in a really bad state, uh, trans people are um, you know, very much vulnerable to discrimination in housing and in employment, being trans really shapes uh, what kind of work is available to you and how you'll be treated in that work. Um, there's a great volume been published recently, this Transgender Marxism volume through Pluto, I really recommend looking at. But, you know, to sort of boil everything down, this constant argument about whether or not trans identities are valid, um, the aim of that is to kind of just bore and annoy us out of the public debate. Um, and you know, it's, it's been increasingly interesting to see how the right uses debate, not as something it thinks it can 
advance this politics by winning, uh, but just simply having the debates and being part of the debates uh, is an end to the self. It doesn't matter if they win or not, you know, it's, it comes as a shock to uh, some of our sort of long 90s friends in the centre that actually, you know, it doesn't matter who wins these debates and, you know, that question, you know, is not just subjective but often irrelevant. Uh, so that's a little bit about the functioning of, of culture war. Um, and I do think we can't ignore it. We do unfortunately have to argue on those terms, but we do also have to be setting our own terms um, for our inclusion in public discussion. Um, and to that end, I want to talk a little bit about my experience of the Culture for Labour project that Tom also mentioned earlier. Um, in the run-up to the 2019 election, I really noticed that a lot of the sort of enthusiasm for Corbyn's Labour that had seemed to be present during the 2017 campaign and shortly after uh, had rather dissipated, um, you know, partly due to a lot of discussions around the, um, the European Union, which you'll be pleased to hear we are not really litigating. Um, I'm not anyway. Um, but... Uh, what I really wanted to do with this Culture for Labour project was, was produce a sort of show of support from people in the arts because I really felt that, um, you know, having, having this support from people in the arts could, could bring back a sense of sort of energy and momentum to the campaign, uh, create a sense of kind of relevance uh, and, and real kind of excitement. Um, and so my friend Kit Kalis from Influx Press and I uh, co-wrote this letter where we talked about, you know, how we endorsed Labour policies on the environment, on workers' rights, on migration, on inequality, but particularly on cultural funding. So um, some of the things like, you know, kind of restoring funding to museums and galleries and libraries and broadening, um, you know, access for the less wealthy to cultural institutions, uh, the arts pupil premium that Jeremy Corbyn wanted to bring in, the National Education Service, um, but also... Um, some of the labour policies aimed at alleviating the effects of gentrification, which have made it increasingly difficult for um, working class artists and, and students uh, to live in cities, live in spaces of cultural production and really be involved in those, in those scenes. Um, you know, we got 500 writers, artists, musicians, filmmakers, other cultural workers to sign. It was very notable, though, that most of them were were either the cultural producers themselves, so, you know, people who tended to, to be more kind of dreamers rather than sort of pragmatists or conservatives, people who are excited by the attempt to build a new society through what was really quite a kind of modernist political project. Um... And we had a lot of them, and then we had a lot of people working in uh, certain roles in the culture industry, but owners of cultural institutions and publications were very, very notable by their absence. What was also notable by their absence was any significant cultural figures supporting the Conservative Party. Um, if you go on Wikipedia, there's a page called Cultural Endorsements in the 2019 general election, and the Labour section is as long as your arm, um, and the Tory one just has Roy Chubby Brown. <laughs> And that's the kind of country we live in. I mean, you know, <laughs> a lot of people are consuming culture primarily from bargain buckets at petrol stations, <laughs> if they can get through the queues. Um, and so we all know what, what happened next. Um, you know, the Tories were incredibly effective, I think, in that election, and UKIP, of course, for a long time before, had been incredibly effective in uh, channeling political resentments, economic resentments through culture, um, you know, uh, and this is this is why you see so many political, or so many, you know, kind of arguments in the mainstream press saying, like, why aren't we allowed to laugh at the Benny Hill show anymore, rather than why have our communities been deindustrialized and left to rot? Um, but we all know what, what followed for the arts, you know, Tory's sort of attack on the arts and arts education, mass redundancies during the pandemic last summer, uh, withdrawal of funding, privatization, attempted privatisation of Channel 4, the kind of ongoing bullying of the BBC and the cowing uh, of, of the BBC and being told that if you don't tow the political line then you will be privatised or you will lose funding. Um, and, you know, a real Tory process of making uh, the media and the media being the point where I think culture and politics 
politics really meet, uh, making the media more compliant, and closing down the cultural imagination. I, you know, I'm, I'm very interested in these ideas of cultural democracy and this idea of broadening access to culture and cultural participation. Um, you know, on on sort of a class basis, uh, but also on the basis of of of, um, of minority participation uh, in the arts. And you know, when you hear the tourists sort of talking about not wanting to go back to the 1970s, you know, often they're talking about not wanting to go back to the time when, uh, you know. In, uh, unionized uh, industrial workers could actually, you know, significantly um, impede on capital if they felt capital was not treating them very well. But they also don't want to go back to a time when, you know, ITV could broadcast a 10 part series in prime time uh, about a left wing Labour MP trying to deal with party factionalism. Uh, I think that's something they don't want to happen again either. Um, and it's very notable that they're closing down. Um, socio-economic uh, power to us as well as as well as cultural I think as, as Owen says these things are are really linked um, so I think there's sort of questions there about how we build a culture that can support a socialist project um, and how we cut through mainstream media attempts to prevent us setting the terms for discussion um, you know, I think culture is a useful way for us to build hegemony that's not entirely reliant on uh, on the Labour Party and its leadership. And it's worth remembering that even during the Corbyn period, um, cultural policy, I think, was one of the things that was slightly less developed because, of course, the brief was held by uh, somebody very much uh, to the right of us. Um, you, you know, you will know, like noted novelist Tom Watson, <laughs> whose uh, newest work has a 16-year-old boy uh, complaining about Punch and Judy politics, and I think anyone who knows any teenagers, there's nothing they hate more than Punch and Judy politics. <laughs> um, but, you know, the 2017 election, I think, is, is nonetheless remains a useful kind of guide to us for the power of, um, of culture and cultural imagination in really uh, inspiring people. I think it's fair to say that the, the moment the Corbyn campaign in 2017 really kind of um, ignited was uh, obviously that speech he gave at, at Prenton Park, the Tranmere Rovers football stadium in Birkenhead, supporting the Libertines. Was he supporting the Libertines? We'll call him a support act. Um, but, you know, he comes on and talks about how, you know, he sort of offers a watered-down version of his rhetoric, talks about loving music and football, uh, and the importance of every child being able to um, learn a musical instrument or, you know, can write poetry or, or novels, um, somehow be involved in, in making culture. And, you know, I think that was what really gave the campaign its kind of emotional core, you may also remember um, a prominent journalist just responding to that with the word, don't encourage them, Jeremy, which I think might be the single most spiteful thing that was said about the whole four years of the uh, of the Corbyn leadership. Um, but again, that, that gives you a sort of indication of the power of culture to genuinely kind of frighten uh, our enemies and why they uh, expend so much effort into suppressing uh, cultural enlightenment uh, amongst uh, the people they want to control. Um, so I think I think that kind of euphoria that was unleashed there, you know, there's a very conscious effort to crush it over the next couple of years, and the culture wars were really a way of doing that, of making people feel kind of worn down, broken, bored, exhausted, um, and, and crowding out um, our discussions. And I think, you know, to its credit, the Corbyn Project often did try to kind of circumvent the setting of these culture war terms by actually making a, um, you know, a decent socio-economic offer. Uh, and that was a, a noble attempt, I think. Unfortunately, I think it was too easily defeated uh, by the media, both just lying about the socio-economic offer uh, and then just really kind of crowding us out by just going back to uh, talking about culture and, you know, the kind of woke liberal elite who were supporting the Corbyn project or whatever um, and also it became very hard to um, to cut through but I think we do still you know for all that's happened since uh, since the end of 2019 I think we do still have some weapons at our disposal uh, you know we can build on these old ideas of cultural democracy we can call for uh, mass participation uh, in literature in music in in film uh, we can call for policies that uh, broaden access to cultural production and adult education um, 
And we can look at, you know, even like uh, Walter Benjamin's uh, premise about politicizing aesthetics as a, um, as a response to the right wing um, aestheticizing politics. Um, and, you know, the, the explosion of um, industrial action during the, the pandemic, the Tate United protests last summer, um, like I said, the linking to anti gentrification movements. Um, these are important outlets for for our demand, um, and I think I would just end by reiterating uh, Dawn's point from earlier that you know unquestioning solidarity with uh, with with minorities of of different backgrounds um, and across across you know the kind of working class movements and and through unions is incredibly important. It was very striking that when the Tory manifesto came out in 2019, a lot of commentators looked at the manifesto and said, this manifesto is very, very thin. It's just culture war. Uh, and lots of people from the Gypsy, Roma, and Traveller communities said, this, this is not just culture war. There are concrete policies in here that are going to really, really, really damage us uh, and you know threaten to take away our homes and our livelihoods uh, and possibly even kill us. Um, that came, you know, came as a response to decades of the Gypsy Roma and Traveller communities being demonised in uh, in mainstream media and through cultural production. So I think um, thinking about how cultural production can be a, a bulwark against these things um, is really important. And and I think those are my main takeaways from from my experience of of trying to think about culture and cultural policy. Um, through this project over the last few years. So I'll stop there. Thank you. I think that last point about um, GRT communities like illustrates it perfectly, really, doesn't it? Like the, the material it impacts of, of, of cultural culture war and cultural struggle. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I think, uh, you know, before we move to questions and before I do a quick plug, actually, um, it, it's, it's probably worth making the point um, to those who, to anyone who maybe does still see culture war as a distraction. It would be less distracting if we were actually winning it, wouldn't it? Um, because if we can, you know, particularly if we can pull down certain structural barriers or barriers structured by culture within our own movement, that would actually widen participation massively and that would strengthen the, the, the whole of the movement. Um, uh, I'm going to beg for some money now. So I want to th thank everybody um, for, for being here and supporting The World Transformed by doing so. Um, I, I would ask you too to support New Socialist. We, we have commissioned an enormous amount of work for our, our forthcoming ecology, ec Ecologies edition. Um, it has taken an enormous amount of work though. and. Um, not you know we pay our contributors but but it's it's a lot basically so I'm you know I'm not going to do a Bob Geldof impression but give us your money please um, <clears throat> moving on from that um, would we be would we like to do some questions from the floor I know we are there any are there any questions for panelists from the floor? You, you can address the panel generally. You can, you can address a particular speaker. All right, great. Um, uh, comrade in the kind of green uh, granddad shirt. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna yeah I'm gonna take three questions and then I'll, we'll we'll do responses if that's right. Comrade, um, in the with the long dark hair uh, in the black, yeah.
uh, comrade at the, in the, with the glasses and the mask sort of pulled down under their chin. <laughs> Take those three for now. Then, um, did you want to go? Did you want to respond first, or any, any? Which of you would like to respond first? Things to say to all of those. Crack on it. Um, regarding your question about radical form um, and the political potential of that. Uh, and, and poetry in particular, um, I mean, firstly, I can do a plug. I can point you to the first episode of the new series of Sweet 212, um, mm -hmm. which was with the poets uh, Ed Luca and Nat Rahar talking about exactly this. So um, uh, listen to that. Um, I mean, this is something I've long been really interested in, you know, the connection between kind of radical form and... Um, you know, the potential for, for radical new forms to kind of lead their audiences to new ways of seeing. Um, again, I mean, I could just relitigate the whole history of modernist culture here and, you know, point out that just as many kind of radical, formal, um, just as much radical formal innovation came from the sort of radical right as the radical left. I mean, it's a very, very complicated thing. Um, but, you know, as somebody who has a long-term interest in avant-garde uh, arts and in radical left politics, um, I do think there is, there is something quite useful in linking, uh, linking those two, two things. Uh, and I think, you know, there is, uh, there is a reason why, um, you know, to develop these things takes a lot of time and, and you know, Tory cultural policy in taking away funding from arts universities in particular and making it harder for artistic communities to form um, is just as much about taking away the space for um, formal ideas and new forms to evolve and new scenes to evolve as it is to take away spaces for, like, class consciousness to form and maybe form through the arts. Um, is it easier to convince middle class liberals or right wing working class people of of you know um, of of the uses of socialist ideas through culture? Um, I mean, I spend a lot of time around middle class liberals, um, and they're very good at doubling down on things. <laughs> um, so I, I I don't know. Maybe I'll hand over at that point, but. I suppose. Um, yeah, you know, just the, the middle class liberals versus right wing working class people thing. I suppose the obvious answer to the question is convince them of what? Which is just asking another question, so it's really annoying. Um, so I apologise. But I suppose my only kind of issue with that formulation is that middle class liberals. Um, <coughs> were, I think, one, I suppose one of the things that was very, very clear in Corbynism is that we were, you know, to quote the post-punk classic, we were shot by both sides. And those were the two sides. Those were the two sides which, through their shared obsession with Brexit, which for most of that period, we were kind of like, you know, look, let's not talk about it, let's just get through this and win the election, and then, you know, then after that we can talk about Brexit. But both middle-class liberals and aging bigots in the Midlands absolutely insisted that we fucking talk about Brexit. And here we are all, because, uh, are all, uh, all are because of this. That Above all else, we lost because of a pincer movement of those two social groups. And um, I think in many ways, appealing to either of them is monumentally difficult. 
Um, and I think there's a, the only kind of thing I would say, I suppose, is that there's a, a sort of easy assumption that the middle class liberals will be more on our side, and that has proven not to be the case. Um, they might be easier to talk to them because they're more polite, but this is deceptive. Highly unqualified to talk about any of this, but, <laughs> you know, as a teacher, um, I just think that we need the arts and creativity now more than ever to feed our radical imagination. And talking about the news media, that's so important. And one of the things that gives me hope is the way in which we can see the democratization of knowledge um, through Twitter, you know, uh, and social media. And literally, I mean, I honestly can't remember the last time I turned the TV to get news. Like, I get my news for social media, and I think a lot of people do that. And um, it's not a free for all. It doesn't mean that, you know, we can uncritically just swallow what's on our Twitter feed, right? So I think m more work needs to be done in teaching critical thinking skills to children and young people in terms of how do we digest what's there, how do we publish, what's the purpose of social media, what's the potential. And in terms of the, the art question, it's so important, especially in terms of like the work we're trying to do as abolitionists to kind of really expand the imaginary all the time. So, um, and it's, I don't think it's a coincidence that the government needs defunding the arts. Uh, you know, and the curriculum, and the EBAC, for example, it's English, math, science, one language, and I think history or something, or geography, not to say any of those subjects aren't important, but where's the arts in all of that? I think that's a deliberate uh, framing of kind of saying, um, you know, we will tell you what culture is, we will define it, these are the parameters and the demar demarcations of it, and um, it's really important that we resist against that, so thank you. Yeah, that was that, that was great. I mean, I mean you know, the, the focus on on attainment in English and maths in in, in mainstream education, I, th I think, really does tell a story about how um, the the kind of um, how government and um, the, you know the hegemonic forces kind of kind of see education. W what do they see it as doing? What's the point of it? As, as far as they're concerned, it's providing capital with a workforce. Basically, it's. <laughs> All right, we've got we've got nine minutes before we have to knock it on the head. Should we do three more questions? <laughs> well, let let everyone have a crack at it. I'll take two more, and then you can oh, you yeah, can yeah. you can you can have a think for a couple of minutes. Um, oh yeah. You say it. You you tell tell them, Owen. Oh no, no, sorry. You're no, no, you, no, you do it. Well, you you. you Um, let's go with there. There is a person with kind of um, uh, uh, sort of ready brown hair and black horn rimmed glasses, and they're wiggling their fingers at me. Yeah. Uh, hello. Uh, I'm Sophie. Yeah. So with.
the fight back against All right, thanks, Sophie. Hopefully someone will say something inspiring. Um, I'm very conscious of, of sort of gender balance with, with this, so I I'm, I'm, apologise if I'm overlooking people. You, you pick somebody. <laughs> um, so pretty much directly in front of me, uh, near the back with your hand up. Um, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, is this, this is tricky by the sort of... How useful is it to collectively together on Go first this time or uh, I can do, yeah. Are you still writing? Uh no no no, I'm 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 done. I was just noting the questions down. Um yeah, um, I mean, the obvious question for me to take there is about how we fight against just endlessly spiralling and frankly quite weird transphobia. Um, and I've been trying for, you know, over a decade in the public realm um, and it's... You all started clapping before I told you how it had turned out. <laughs> um, which has been unsatisfactory so far. Um, I mean, in terms of fighting them at this point, I mean, you know, as I said earlier, one of the, the main sort of way that these culture wars kind of work, the idea is to be unwinnable. Um, and, you know, for, for trans, trans and non-binary people fighting this culture war against um, transphobes, you know, the argument really comes down to trans people saying, like, these are our identities, we have been thinking very hard about them, we have spent decades working out a language to convey them, um, and, you know, there is a long-term history behind them, so this is who we are and who we'd like to be recognized as and transphobes say no it isn't and there's not that much you can do directly with that you know if these people don't want to be persuaded and as we've seen on on sort of arguments online actually just arguing directly with them just seems to make them worse uh, and you know you may find say former sitcom writers who are prepared to kind of like tank their entire family, livelihood, friendship circle, uh, whatever, in order to just kind of continue having this argument at three o'clock in the morning under a pseudonym on mum's net. <laughs> and people said the way I live was disgusting. <laughs> But I think one way to deal with that is to try and open up other fronts in these culture wars. I mean, you know, um, I've just published a volume of, uh, of short stories about the history of trans and non-binary people in Britain, which is another subtle way of uh, plugging uh, some of my work. But, um, you know, the idea behind doing that was not to argue directly with them. And I think you do need to argue directly with them. And someone like Sean Faye has published this book, The Transgender Issue, which does very patiently go through all of the talking points being set by like anti-trans people in mainstream media uh, and, and argue with them. And of course, that's not really aimed so much at the people who are rabidly doubling down. It's aiming, at, you know, kind of allies who want to be part of this argument. So one way around it is to, you know, structure and focus your your work, whether that's activism or creative work or art or whatever, in such a way as to, you know, recruit more people to your side and so, you know, spread the burden of, of argument because this stuff is really fucking exhausting and it's by design. Uh, and the other thing to do is open up new, new cultural fronts and maybe not have those arguments directly and that's another way of, like, winning people round is to show, you know, sort of, creativity, imagination, empathy, 
uh, and and so forth. And you know, our enemies can't really fight us on those fronts because they then have to like be good at writing novels and making music and stuff. And all they really seem to be able to do is just like argue on Twitter. So, um, I'm J.K. Rowling's just done that 900-page rewrite of the Brian De Palma film, Dressed to Kill, I guess. But um, otherwise, there's not much coming on on that front. So I think the arts can be a very useful tool for us as well. you like to respond? Um, on that, that, that last question, I'm not sure if I... So, it was a sort of question of sort of receiving culture from outside versus doing it itself, right? That was the, the, the gist of it. Rather, yes. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, it's, it, it, this is a, obviously a hugely important thing and it's something which... Um, I think has been hugely exacerbated by the last 18 months that, you know, a huge amount of us have been forced to, you know, solely kind of consume cultural artefacts via, you know, sort of um, streaming companies and, and via the, the hell that is Twitter and, you know, obviously that's that's been enormously debilitating. Um, but sort of forging those collectivities, I suppose, you know, uh, it's obviously a, a, a good and important thing, and I'm all for it. I suppose I was just sort of at the start, sort of getting at some of the ways in which they're not always that wonderful places to be. Um, but you know, I'm, I'm, I'm all for all the ravers in Epping Forest going off and doing their raving. I think that's wonderful. <laughs> Kelsey, <laughs> your question is about care. Those who do. As educators, there's two things I want to say about that. There's two, please, really, if there's any teachers in the room or educators, anybody that cares about education, only one can apply pressure on people that can influence education, and that is that education is at crisis point, and a big part of that crisis is who, <laughs> who is education for and who is left out. And um, if we're serious about what we said earlier, that we don't leave anyone out, I think it was Dawn that was talking about that, then we really do need to have a serious rethink about what we mean by inclusion, what do we mean by inclusive education, what do we mean by coalition of politics, what do we mean by allyship, and ultimately, what do we mean by education? I went into it 21 years ago um, with the idea that education is a practice of freedom to quote Bell Hooks and Paulo Freire. And I still believe that, but it isn't how it is um, conceptualized at the moment. I can't see myself in a classroom, and I'm not in a classroom, because I refuse to be an agent of oppressive policies and practices. And um, I spend all my time thinking about how I can contribute to a transformation that is desperately needed. So I think we have to talk back have the courage to do what Josh I was talking about earlier is doing. Um, and, and I think more and more of us have to realize that, it's, you know, I'm talking about education, but this could apply easily to other public sector workers, that we work for the people. We're not there for the head teacher or the governing body or the local authority. We work for the people, and therefore we have a responsibility. <laughs> to make sure that all of the people in our care are seen, heard, and, and looked after, as well as educated. Thank you very much. All right, I'm going to end by thanking, thanking our palace. Thank you, to, thank you to Dawn, thank you to Juliet, thank you to Owen, and thank you to Zara. Thank you, thank you. Please. Please continue to support the World Transform. Please continue to support New Socialist. And I'll end by saying there is a culture war and we are going to fight it. Thank you. Thank you, Tom.